lovely day! Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome in once again. Today we're going to be taking a look at two offerings from QSP that are fairly new. And they're both in very different directions from what we're accustomed to seeing. Now, go back just a couple of years ago, and nobody really knew who QSP were. And when they first started coming onto the scene, people really weren't sure what to think. Because, you know, here's another brand coming out of nowhere, coming out with very, very inexpensive knives. And nobody could really tell, are they really going to be worth even investing into, are they going to be any type of quality? But what a lot of people didn't know was QSP was doing OEM work for a lot of brands that people were already buying and already loving. So now what QSP is doing is they are expanding outward into a lot of different things. And the first of which that we're going to get into is the Rhino. Now, the Rhino is going to be their first step into an upper level price point. An upper level for them, you got to realize, you know, when you get into something like the Penguin that you could get for as low as $40, or you could get for $70 or $80 in full titanium frame lock, or their slightly upgraded model with the Timascus that was on it, I think was 100 and something, low hundreds, 129 or something like that. Now you're stepping up into a price point that they're very unfamiliar with. And I think, honestly, um, it's going to take them a little more time to figure it out. But they got a lot of stuff right on this Rhino. And I want to show that to you, show you what I think they did right, what I think they can adjust for future models to satisfy this level of the market. They've already dominated that lower price segment. They've dominated the typical budget price segment. And now as they're trying to reach up just a little bit higher, I think they need a little bit of help and feedback from the rest of us. Now, another one here that I want to show you is something that, honestly, I don't really ever show on my channel because I don't like them, typically. As a matter of fact, the only times that you've seen me come out here with one of these uh, was an Andre DeVillers custom that was significantly more money. So for me to get into one of these, take something special. Now, QSP didn't say that I had to do anything with this knife except for just, you know, take a look at it, enjoy it, whatever. Um, but I did choose to do photography and I did choose to do a review because I got to tell you, this may be a turning point for myself and for a lot of other people to start getting into these. And if you haven't already, I completely understand because, you know, we're not, a lot of my viewers are like me. They're under 60, they're, they were attracted into knives for a lot of different reasons, but a lot of the stuff that we tend to buy will be uh, folders that you can manipulate with one hand, opening and closing. Um, Maybe something that's a flipper or uh, has a specific type of lock or is a specific kind of tactical style. And we may not be very interested in the traditional knives. And really, that's the way I've always been. With that Andre de Villers, I liked it a lot because it was more of a modern look than a traditional look. It was more of that tactical style look. But... It really was the only slip joint that kind of sung to me. And it was really, really nice. You know, but that was 400 and some odd dollars. Here is an affordable slip joint. If you thought about maybe, well, I, you know, I, I've heard a couple of things. Maybe a slip joint would be nice to have in a nice leather slip in my pocket. And just kind of have as a, as a super keen, razor sharp little folding knife to have. That doesn't necessarily need to be a fidget toy or needs to be flipped or or a one hand manipulation. Just a good deep in the pocket kind of carry. But I don't want to spend three, four, five hundred dollars or up into the thousands for a high end custom version. I need something more affordable to get my feet wet. And I think this one, this might just be it. This is the QSP Hedgehog, and. While there is a full titanium version, I believe those might be sold out. So getting into one of these carbon fiber versions or one of their micarta versions, 
may be a good way for you to go. Now, I'm certainly not going to try to talk you into it. If you're not into traditionals, that's totally fine. I 100% understand that. But this is one that if you're on the fence and you don't want to you know, really put a lot of money into it, this might be a good way to go. So let's take a look at these up close and personal and see if you feel about them how I feel about them. All right, let's start things off with what may end up being the most important thing for each of you to hear. Number one, if you're interested in the QSP Rhino, which is the titanium frame lock flipper, it's $430. So as I mentioned again before in the in the intros there, you know, that's the first time they've ever gone anywhere near that premium price point. And I think that's going to be an interesting step for them. And I'm excited to see what they do as they keep uh, stepping into those waters. Now, if you're interested in the Hedgehog, you're looking at about $85 to $87, not expensive at all, especially in the world of quality slip joints. Quality slip joints are going to cost you a couple hundred dollars. There's just no way around it. There's a lot of cheap slip joints, but quality ones that will match up to this will cost you a few hundred and up into the thousands if you were buying customs. So let me go ahead and start with my favorite of the two, and that is going to be the Rhino. This is going to be your packaging here. Not sure why my camera isn't auto-focusing, but there it is right there. M390 blade, flat grind, bronze, stone wash, titanium handle. Now, uh, I know some other people have done reviews on this knife, and they keep calling the backspacer and the clip uh, Timascus. It is not. It is Mokutai. And there's not a major difference in the components. They're trademark names, so it's important to have the have them correct. Uh, Timascus is Alpha Knife Supply, and Mokutai is Chad Nichols. So this is Chad Nichols Mokutai, according directly to QSP. So you always get some uh, some cool stickers in your packaging from QSP. Better knife, better life. Couldn't agree more. And the cute little penguin. And then here is going to be your specs. And see, right there, it says Moku Tai. And you could put an eye on that if you want to and pause it and all that kind of good stuff, but I will give you the specs again later on. And this is the velvet-lined cushion box. I like this. I like that slide box. I think it's really, really cool. And they've done this on some other models as well. There are things to love about this knife, and there are things that could be kind of, eh, not so great, but not bad. And I think we need to discuss all of them. So let's start. You know what? Let's let's be smart about it. Let's start with the specs. I already showed you the card, but it is important to go ahead and get everything laid out here. So here we go. On the Rhino, it is a titanium frame lock flipper. Overall length of seven and a half inches. Blade is three and a quarter inches in M390 at 130 thousandths of an inch thick. Um, the blade is somewhat of a hybrid. It's a clip point plus Americanized Tanto, which is really interesting. I can't think of too many knives that I've seen in that vein. Americanized Tanto basically is a very short, abrupt, and upright uh, Tanto uh, type of style. And obviously, this is going to represent the clip point up here. Let's see. Big fuller in there. I love that big fuller. Uh, handle is four and a quarter inches. It's a slab-sided titanium frame, but uh, very good beveling and softening of the edges. So there absolutely are no hot spots. Your backspacer and your pocket clip are both Mokutai with a beg ball buried into that uh, clip. 
You have a steel lock bar insert. You have a captured flat faced pivot so it will not spin as you're unscrewing or screwing it and ceramic bearings. And that is going to be it for the specs. Uh, action is pretty darn good. Uh, my love, I've noticed on a few QSP models, they sometimes take a little bit of break in, so I do expect it to get a little bit smoother. For those of you lube heads that like to lubricate everything, even though you don't ever need to lubricate bearings, specifically ceramic bearings, there is no cause for it whatsoever. Um, I, th I think if you were to probably lubricate them, you'll get uh, a quicker feel of how it's going to break in. By the time the lube wears off, that will be uh, all broken in for you. But it feels really, really nice. The detent, however, is a little bit light. If, if I go to just barely touch it, and of course right now it's just going to open. There we go. If you just barely touch it, you can get it to fail. But really, you're going to be putting a conscious effort on that. If you're uh, flicking it, you've got a nice deep fuller groove here to get your finger into. It is a little bit rounded off from all the stone washing, so it doesn't grab like uh, some other knives. Um, there are knives out there with that have just a little bit more of an edge to them there. This is really, really, really stone washed, so it's been softened quite a bit just from that process. Love the flat face pivot. QSP does it very, very well. I love the architecture of the frame. I, I love the way they did this cutout. Yes, you have really good access to your lock bar here, but they also over accentuated it. I love that. I love how they accentuated that bevel so that your fingers wrap around it really, really nicely. I love that. Again, everything else is rounded off nicely. They did a really good job with the overall design. It's stout looking, it's beefy looking without actually being overly beefy, and it's handsome. Love the Mokutai clip. Let's get a close up on that. Really beautifully done. There is the beg ball. That is a ceramic ball set in there and a larger ceramic ball in the uh, bottom. Ball type clips like uh, like Todd Begg's clip really is the best. You don't have to have, you can have a good amount of tension on that clip and it will still slide out of the pocket when you're, when you're grasping it and going to withdraw it. It comes out much more easily than if you just have a, a standard ramp style. We'll take a look at this. And if the tension is too tight on that, you can't get it in the pocket or out of the pocket. It's, it's pulling your pocket as you're trying to do either one. The ball allows it to slide in and out easily, but still have a really, really, really strong grip. Backspacer is absolutely a work of art. Truly beautifully done. I mean, I really, really like this. This is called, and back here and up here on the uh, blade spine, this is decorative. This is not jimping. And I've noticed a few people referring to it as jimping and how they wish the jimping was better so that you could access the front flipper. The front flipper is absolutely and 100% completely useless. If you're only buying this to be a front flipper, don't buy it. But this is not jimping. This is a decorative rope file work. Now, I don't know if they've actually done this with hand files. I would uh, obviously think not that it was done by machine. But what they're doing is they are replicating the look that you would see in high-end, really started with high-end fixed blades, um, crowning the spine, so rounding it gently, and then uh, carving into it, whether it be with files or if you're really, really good with your belt grinder, you could do it with the very edge of your belt. And uh, that is a rope pattern decorative file work. And that is being replicated here in the backspacer as well. And I'll be honest with you, I typically don't like any type of pattern milled into Timascus or Mokutai because it's already such a busy material. Um, I really want just the pattern of the material to stand on its own and, and show its own beauty. But a rope style file work looks really, really elegant. Here's the thing. This isn't an elegant knife. That type of work should have been put into a knife designed to be a little bit more elegant looking. This is very brute looking. It's very tough looking. It's, it's honestly, it's very industrial looking in its overall design. The blade, the blade finish, the big fuller, the shape of the handles, the beveling that's been done. Everything on this looks like 
an industrial type of design. Yet you had this beautiful decorative rope work and it just, to me, it kind of clashes a little bit. I love that, decora that, that decorative work. I think it's gorgeous. I just think it's misplaced on this particular knife. Uh, another con for me is making it a fighter style handle. Fighter style handles can work if the handle is large enough. This was made to be a compact knife with that three and a quarter inch blade. If you have small to medium hands, you're gonna love this thing. You'll have no problem. Large to extra large hands, my hand is being squeezed on there because this, I have nowhere to put my pinky. It forces it down into the frame. Let me give you an example here of what I'm talking about. If you're going to have a compact knife, here's one with pretty much should be about the exact same sized handle. It's a little bit larger, but it's still kind of small. But the way that they've tapered it this way, I've got a landing spot for my pinky. So it's very, very comfortable in the hand. You have to realize also you have a you have basically a finger guard here because of the flipper tab. So does this. But where it stops me here, it lets me do what I want back here, and I've got a landing spot. Let's take a look at a couple more just so that you know we're clear that I'm not picking this apart for no reason. Here's another one. Very, very small handle. This one should be very comparable in size. Yep, it's even a little, let's see, end to end. Yeah, it's almost identical. So you see, it's small, but it's not coming down and forcing my fingers to be all cramped up. So I can have this compact knife, this compact carry, and still hold it however I want. Now, if you're going to Bring it around like that. Uh, the Avian Knives Atlas is a great example. You could see that it has that same type of shape going on, but it's not as aggressive. And where it comes back at you, it's flat. So it's another one where my finger can only go so far forward because of the flipper tab, yet I could put my fingers where I want them to. I can also choke up because I've got a finger choil. And I have that finger choil on most of the knives. So if there had been a large finger choil here, or this was less aggressive, I really wouldn't have really anything to complain about. So that's really it. That's my negatives on this knife. And I want to get those out of the way first because really it's not about the negatives with this knife. There's so many positives. I love how it feels as far as the action, the lockup. Uh, again, I do wish the, the detent strength was a little bit stronger. It's a little bit light for my taste. But if it was a knife that you carry often, you're going to adapt to it without a problem. If you're bouncing around from a lot of different knives and most of your knives have a really exceptional detent, then yeah, you're, you might have a little bit of a problem with that. I love the fuller. I love the blade shape. Again, while I do love that file work, I, I just think it's... It would have been better suited for a dressier looking knife instead of something so industrial. But they did a great job of elevating this knife with giving it some upgrades that do make it worth more than your typical budget level priced QSP. So if you've been looking at one of these and going, well, I don't know if I can justify the price on it. You might want to do this. You might want to wait till you're, you know, you've got some, I don't know, some spending points on a particular website uh, and, and get, you know, $30, $40, $50 dollars off, or you catch them on a sale or something like that, or buy it on the secondary market. Um, but I think as a knife, you're going to love it. It's beautiful. They did a really great bronze anodization. They polished and anodized the Mokutai wonderfully. They've mastered that. They've got the right colors coming out of it. It's not going into the, the light, light, light baby blues, yellows, and whites. That's an indication uh, of someone that doesn't know what they're doing, and they're, they're overblowing the colors. They're torching it for too long, and they've blown past all the actual colors to the point where they would actually have to refinish the entire piece and then 
uh, torch it again. These are the appropriate colors for Mokutai and uh, Timascus. You've got the uh, over-travel stop. You've got the ceramic bearings. You've got a wonderful, wonderful edge on this thing. Little thick. It's a little thick behind the edge, but still really, really nice cutter. I've cut a couple of things, but not many. And it's performed just as I would have expected it to. Again, if you wanted it as a front flipper because you saw the extension, yeah, good luck. Your, your finger's just going to slide right off of there. I could almost not do it by holding it this way. You see, you hear how soft it's opening. It's not ripping open. So, because again, this is not jimping. It is decoration only. It's to beautify it. So that's my thoughts on the Rhino. I really dig the overall concept. I really dig the quality they put into it. But I think at $430, they're in very, very steep competition. And I think a few little, a little adjustments on this design and it's going to be one that will be very, very popular for them. So I'm, I'm interested to see what a Generation 2 comes out like if they get rid of that aggressive downturn in the frame that cramps up a larger sized hand. I think that will make a huge, huge, huge change. If they're going to do this uh, decorative file work, then this needs to be a dressier design. That really should be relegated to a different knife altogether. Do some nice... Uh, I don't know if you would just do some nice jimping, like uh, hand file checkering, like you'd see on the front strap of a, a high end custom 1911. Do something like that. That would be appropriate for this kind of industrial style. So, them's my thoughts on that. Oh, I wanted to give you a weight on there as well before I move on very, very quickly. So, you're looking at four and a half ounces up against the VBR. That's 5.1 ounces, so it's a little bit lighter. And then uh, it's only 2.6 ounces on the Avian. Not much compares to that. So I think that you're looking at um, on, on the heftier side of an EDC, but it's absolutely um, not beyond the realm of possibility for you to carry as an everyday knife. Now, let's get into what ended up surprising me the most, the Hedgehog. I do not like slip joints. I don't like them. It's not my style of knife. I'm not a traditional knife person. Never have been, and I doubt that I ever really will be. However, I have found myself playing with this thing so much since it arrived that I got to tell you, while it may not have turned me into a slip joint addict, it has given me a good idea of why people really do like them. This thing is built like a tank. And when you get that blade open and you take a look at the back spring going up into the spine of the blade, it's, I mean, it's showing up pretty well here, but it's in, in real life. You almost can't tell because realize what the back spring is doing here. It's flexing. So it's raising upward over the corners of the tang of the blade. So it separates from the two liners that are there. They're almost completely seamless. They're so well done. The half notch there works really, really, really well. That half stop is really, really strong sucks in very well when you go to close it. And I think it's another thing that never really attracted me to slip joints is, I don't know, I guess I, I have this fear that in some way my finger is going to be in the way or thumb. And once you've gotten to the point of no return, that thing slams shut. You're going to slice off anything that you've got sticking out in there. But that's just, you know, maybe my, my mind going wild. And that's a slip joint thing, not a QSP thing. What I will say about this is it's a really nice traditional with a modern take. If you look at the texturing that's been done here, very, very nice on the texturing. It's almost an Anzo pattern, but uh, each of these don't meet in the middle like an Anzo pattern would. Let's get in there nice and tight. We can really see that. So you can see all of the divots that have been ground in. And then the double line milling in there. Nice flush pivot. 
There is the contouring on the frame, which they did a great job with. They even finished the inside of the frame nicely and the inside of the back spring. Let's get a good look at this as it's operating. I want you guys to see all the way around. So, it's got it's got a pretty nice sound to it as you're you know you're kind of manipulating it. Now the uh, the only real con for me on this is the edges of the spine of the blade are actually sharp. You can actually cut something with the spine of the blade. I do not like that. I don't mind it being a little even a little bit harsh, but it needs to be knocked off just a teeny tiny little bit. And honestly, taking a few strokes with a scotch bright pad would have been enough. Now, I'm not saying that you as a customer should do that because you can wreck your finishes. I mean, at the factory, if they had gone over that with a scotch bright belt and then done all their finishing to you know keep any errant scratches off of the blade, that really would have been a great way to go. But this is actually one, believe it or not, I'm gonna find somebody to make me a custom slip and I'm going to carry this. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to carry it every day because, again, this really isn't my style. But I have become so intrigued by this, and I have found myself fidgeting with it and playing with it. I've opened a couple of packages. This is utterly, insanely sharp, really deep hollow grind that I think I'm going to actually order a slip to, to, to fit this properly and be protected in my pocket so that I can carry it and enjoy it. Because I, I, if they would have asked and said, hey, you want to check out the hedgehog? I would have gone, hey, no, because <laughs> I don't like slip joints. Uh, but I opened the box and it was in there. I'm like, all right, well, let me play with it. And I've been enjoying the shit out of it. Sue me. Let's talk about specs. This is a slip joint. Overall length is 6.625 inches. Blade is 2.87, I'm, I'm sorry. 2.875 inches, and it is a 14C28N steel, which is very, very slicey. You can go down to a very, 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 very fine edge, and it's easy to maintain, easy to resharpen yourself at home. Thickness is about 110 thousandths of an inch thick, so it's a really thin blade stock. Again, it's a gentleman's knife. It's a traditional. It's not meant to be a big, beefy, oversized knife. The handle, when closed, three and three quarters of an inch, nicely contoured on that carbon fiber. And it is a very deep hollow grind that is thin and slicey. Now, uh, I when I first got it in, I grabbed my micrometer and I checked the thickness behind the edge. And I, I don't remember if it was exactly what it was. I know it was under um, 10 thou. I think it was like 0, 0, 7, 0, uh, is it 0, 0.07 or 0, 0.08. It was really, really thin back there. So, I mean, obviously not a razor, but pretty damn close. And uh, a finer edge than the majority of the tactical style pocket knives that you have in your collection. So I think for somebody that actually wants to cut stuff, you're going to get a lot of use out of this. Having this Warncliffe style blade where you've got that defined point instead of a tip is going to be great for slicing open boxes. It's going to be great for cutting through tape and through uh, package, uh, you know, packaging straps and things like that. It's a thin blade that will get up under there and it'll slice right through it without really any effort whatsoever. So overall, I really, really like it. So this might be my biggest surprise of the year, me liking a slip joint. Or I should say me liking a slip joint that isn't a 400 and some odd dollar uh, custom slip joint. There, that may be a better way of putting it. And this definitely is much more of a traditional look than the last slip joint, the only other slip joint that I've ever reviewed. So them's my thoughts on both the Hedgehog 
and the Rhino. Let me know your thoughts down below. Do you think the QSP uh, did a good job on these and they should be charging 430 or should we be looking at a different kind of style for that price point and for these materials? And sound off about slip joints. Are you a slip joint fan? Do you just not like slip joints? Have you tried them and went, eh, it's not the worst thing in the world, but I can't find the right one that really, you know, tickles my pickle. Uh, is this doing some pickle tickling? I don't know. Let me know in your, uh, in the comments down below. If you get a chance, please do join my Patreon, help support the channel. I love my Patreons. Thank you guys so much. Uh, you are a big reason why I'm able to do what I'm doing. And for everyone that supports me, I get to bring out more and more and more good stuff. So thank you so very much. And I will see you on the next video.